Just uh, before I read you Paul's biography, he has uh, had a very long flight from the United Kingdom. He'll be going to, I think, Washington next week. He was just in uh, another country. He's traveling all over the place. And like Michael, he was here all day, had dinner, and then showed up. So I, uh, I again, want to thank them. They're definitely uh, giving us their all. Paul is a leading expert on the role of neuroscience in educational practice and policy. He uses his understanding of cognition and neuroscience to explore how emerging technologies can enhance child and adult learning. His research focuses on creativity, educational technology, and learning games. Among his recent publications is The Impact of Digital Technologies on Human Well-Being, which was published by the, for the Nominant Trust in 2011. If you go on YouTube, you'll find a Royal Society of the Arts uh, uh, sponsored lecture where Paul uh, talks a little bit about some of the things he talks about tonight. But again, it's changing so rapidly that even when we talked a week ago, things have been updated. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Howard Jones. Thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I'm not used to having one of these microphones in my hand, except for uh, karaoke. Um, I am going to try to resist, though. Don't worry. Um, my, my day job is researching issues at the interface of neuroscience and education. So uh, as part of this research network, I carry out basic neuroscience, do bridging studies to find out whether the concepts are meaningful in the classroom, help teachers develop classroom practice related to what, how we understand our brain operates, um, public communication exercises and consultation with teachers. The last thing being very important, I think, because there's a growing debate in a number of areas uh, related to how we should apply what we know about neuroscience in education and the voice of teachers I think is often underrepresented so um, it's a privilege for me to to try to raise the profile of teachers voice in that debate um, I guess that the story I want to tell you tonight started off with with headlines um, we've had several every year but I've just picked one per year here um, <laughs> Google is degrading our intelligence. Facebook is infantilizing us in the Guardian there. Technology is the 21st century addiction. This was one from the, the Daily Mail, one of our most notorious newspapers. Facebook and Twitter are creating a vain generation of self-obsessed people with childlike need for feedback, warns top scientist. And uh, I'm indebted to Phil for, for passing me this headline, which is uh, from um, a more local newspaper. I think you might recognize it, the Globe and Mail. Uh, more activity, less screen time urged for young kids. So this is, this is an issue which is all very frequently in the headlines. Um, BBC published an article on it yesterday. And because of the concerns and anxieties reflected in the newspapers and, and from the voices of parents, I was asked to look at 170 uh, research papers related to how technology might be affecting our brains. This was sponsored by the, the Nominet Trust, and uh, I'm indebted also to Sam Bevington, who drew many of the cartoons that you'll see tonight. So let's deal with a, a couple of the basics to start off with. This idea that technology is rewiring our brains. Well, perhaps the myth here is the fact that our brains are hardwired in the first place. We see images such as this. Uh, I mean, these images were generated by Gary Small and colleagues. And what we're looking at is those parts of the brain that are more active when Googling than when reading a book. And we see that increase in activity for naive users on the left and for experienced users on the right. And you can see that for naive users, there's a bit of increase in visual cortex there. And in the, but in the right-hand picture, for experienced Google users, those people who've been using Google frequently, you can see there's a whole range of different areas that are activating more intensely when they're Googling than when they're reading a book. So I think this is fairly hard evidence that Google is rewiring our brains. The question is, should we be worried about it? Because the brain is plastic. The brain changes. Uh, that's how we learn. It changes its neural connectivity, the connections between neurons. It changes, um, there's a shift that you can observe in the functional activity. So one area will become more active, another area may become less active where we've learned something. And this 
is uh, these images here have been generated from adult brains who have been learning how to do complex multiplication. After they have been trained, you can see that in the left-hand image, this, this is where activity decreases in the frontal areas of the brain related to uh, a reduction in working memory load. Working memory is, is very much a bottleneck to new learning. Working memory is our ability to hold things in our attention. And when we're learning something new, it, that puts a particular strain on working memory. Uh, we're trying to remember what the teacher told us or what the various stages are of the uh, problem that we're, we're trying to solve. We're trying to remember the mistakes that we made last time. There's a lot of conscious, a lot of things we have to hold in our conscious attention. So that places a, wor a load on working memory that is then reduced, and that's the area of the brain where activity is reduced after we've actually um, done our learning. In contrast, there are regions in the posterior parts of the brain that actually increase activity after learning complex multiplication. And those areas are to do with automaticity. Um, so in other words, what's really happening here is that as a result of rehearsing our complex multiplication, we are moving from a situation where we have to think about things very consciously to a situation where we are carrying things out more effortlessly and more automatically. So that shift in brain activity is quite common when we're looking at um, brain images uh, of learning. It's not just functional um, changes, it's, sorry, it's not just functional connectivity that changes, we can actually see changes in the structure of the brain. So we're talking about the size and shape of different parts of the brain. And this is an interesting study that was done by Dragansky. He asked people, uh, young adults, to learn to juggle. They identified the parts of the brain that were um, increasing activity as a result, uh, sorry, uh, when, when they were learning to juggle, and they found that those parts of the brain actually increased their size after three months of learning to juggle. So in the diagram in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see uh, scan one, which was the baseline, time equals zero. Three months later, uh, the parts of the brain which are highlighted in, in yellow increased their size, and after three months, when they stopped learning to juggle, those parts of the brain had reduced their, uh, in, their, their, their increase in size, but they still had not actually um, resulted back to baseline yet. So there are really quite um, significant changes that can occur in the brain whenever we, we learn something. So then we go back to these images, and possibly we feel a bit less anxious about them. And when you think about it, if you've actually... An if you're an experienced user of Google, then when you use Google, you're probably going to be doing it in a very different way to a, a naive user who hasn't used it before. You're going to be using more search strategies. You're going to be making decisions about the sorts of words that you might want to put in, the sort of combinations of words, maybe. You'll be reasoning about the types of results that you get back. And in fact, that all those parts of the brain that we see are increasing their activity amongst experienced Google users can be linked to those types of uh, learning processes, those sorts of reasoning that you might expect having learned how to use Google properly. So really, this is not too much to worry about. Now, I've said the brain is plastic, um, but some brains are more plastic than others, particularly young brains. So it is appropriate that if we're going to worry about what technology is doing to the brain, we should focus on children, and particularly young children. And research in the 90s showed that greater internet use was linked to reduced social connectedness and well-being. So perhaps there is some basis for headlines such as Facebook is infantilizing our brains. And you know, perhaps we should be concerned that we have so many children uh, using social network sites if we believe that this is going to lead to reduced social connectedness and well-being. But when you think about the types of uh, technology that was available in the 1990s, I don't know if any of us can remember that. Some of us can remember that. Some of us may not. Um, I can. We had text-only websites. Um, we had to write our websites using HTML markup language. Um, you know, there's this idea of, of Windows. Windows was on the horizon. Uh, Windows 95, I think, was the first version that came out. You know, um, and I remember thinking, well, that'll never last. That'll never take off. What's wrong with DOS? You know. <laughs> oh, you remember DOS? Well, okay. <laughs> 
Um, this, this is a very different world. And, and if you think about um, teenagers who are spending a lot of their time doing this sort of stuff, then maybe there is a basis to expect that they would have become somewhat socially isolated. <laughs> very few of their friends would have been online to talk to. And then we look at the recent social network research and we find that the, re the relationship has actually reversed. Now we find that the recent research is telling us that social network sites generally stimulate teenage social connectedness and psychosocial well-being. And I think this is a reminder that not only the technology is changing all the time, but also our relationship with technology is changing all the time as well. So all of this research that we're looking at uh, now and in the future is going to be about trying to track a moving target. And that's why we need up-to-date uh, research going on all the time really. Now of course there are risks involved with social network sites. Cyberbullying and abuse are, are, are ones that have been particularly highlighted. Um, but when you actually look at the instances uh, with which these things occur, you actually find that they are quite rare uh, and unusual compared with the sorts of everyday risks that children normally run. Um, for example, in 2006, an American study showed that um, of all the serious crimes against children, only 2% were internet related. And in fact, that was a reduction um, on the figure that had been produced by a survey done a few years previously. So there was a sense in which the statistics lo were low and actually reducing. That's not what you might gather from the sensationalist headlines um, and the sort of anxieties that many parents, including myself, were, were, were feeling about uh, social network sites. And I think the other interesting thing is that when you look at the circumstances that are involved with these instances, they, they quite often point to issues that are not actually specific to the technology. And when we look at the sorts of interventions that are needed in order to safeguard children against these types of abuse, we find that it's as much um, about improving their general awareness and avoidance skills uh, more really than the technology. So in other words, it's the same skills and wisdoms that these children need to acquire to avoid bullying in the playground as it is to avoid bullying in uh, cyberspace. Uh, but it is, I, there is a caveat I have to offer here with respect to this good news that social network sites are, are, are positively correlated to social connectedness. Because actually it's only true if teenagers are using them to support existing friendship networks. Um, those teenagers who, who frequently indulge in using these sites to make new friends that they have not yet met face to face, um, there is a a risk factor associated with that for poor social well-being. So it really is about how you use the technology rather than the technology itself. Now this is an interesting study that came out since I've done the review and I thought I'd share this with you today because um, you know, th this idea that technology and, and things like Facebook might be affecting our brains, well here is evidence to show that this really is the case because it appears that there are certain parts of the brain where the density of the grey matter is actually related to the number of friends that you have on Facebook. <laughs> no, I am, I'm serious. <laughs> so, the size of your online social network is actually proportional to certain parts, or, sorry, is proportional to the grey matter density in certain parts of the brain that are associated with social processes, but they tend to be memory-related social processes. In fact, there are other parts of the brain which are also related to your online social network size, which um, are co also correlated with your offline social network size. So the amygdala, for example, if you have a lot of friends, face-to-face -face friends that you meet on a regular basis, uh, then you are likely to have higher uh, grey matter density in your amygdala, and that's an important part of the brain for social processing, uh, including emotional social processing. And that is also true uh, if you have a large set of Facebook friends. But there are some additional areas shown in this diagram which are correlated only to your online social network size. Now, the authors of the paper are, are very careful, and I, I respect them for this, for not over-interpreting these results. But my interpretation is that in line with what I've already said, um, really, that social network relationships are not the same as offline relationships, but they can be a healthy extension. 
So is the internet bad for us? Well, I don't really think that's really a meaningful question because it's a matter of what you do with it. And the analogy that I would bring to your attention is that of one of our oldest technologies, fire. Is fire good for us? Well, it's good for warmth. It's good for toasting muffins. And I'm told you do have muffins. <laughs> Otherwise, I should have made a, co a different cultural version of these slides. Um, but it's bad if it's used carelessly. We don't read headlines saying, you know, um, panic, fire may destroy us. <laughs> we've come to understand the dangers and we've, we're able to take the precautions. And that's what we're trying to work towards, I think, with, with technology. And it's about how we use technology, uh, when, how much, and what for. Now, um, I'm going to make a little diversion here. Uh, before today, I'd never given this sort of presentation, so th it's a bit of a first. But I, as well as being a, a scientist, I'm also a parent. Um, and these are my five children here, um, aged 5 to 16. And all the time that I was collecting this research and having a look at this data, of course, I was thinking, OK, I have to prepare the facts, I have to prepare the facts, I have to prepare the facts, stick to the facts. But I was also thinking, what am I going to do about this? in terms of my own family, because some of the facts were quite surprising and I hadn't known about them. So having written the report, I then worked with my partner to develop this book that's uh, available on lulu.com, which contains all the facts from the report, but it also contains uh, some narrative about sharing our experience as parents about what we tried to do, having become aware of the facts. Because I do think there's two stages to this process. We need to have the information, we need to know what we know and what we don't know but we also need to start thinking about what we're going to do about it. So um, inside, this, uh, inside this book, we, we set about providing the research with full references because I, you very often read things about technology in newspaper articles um, and, and also in, in, po in the popular press. You find statements being made and you think, well, how do they know that? Where is the research? And is it in a well-published journal? Is it research that I should respect? So, you know, forgive me for the 160 references that are, that are at the back of the book. And, and then we tried to summarize in, in, in simple terms what we can be sure we know, but also what we don't know. Because there's an awful lot of question marks. The research is really only just beginning to take off in this area. And then also providing an example of what we've done as parents, but being really careful not to give advice, because I don't feel qualified to give advice to parents. My attitude is that all families, all children, and contexts are unique. And, and what families, children, students, teachers really need is actually the information and the facts. And then they can make better informed decisions about the approaches that they will take. And those approaches are quite often going to be unique in themselves. So whenever you have a blue line around the slide, that's when I'm going off on one. That's when I'm actually talking about the experience that I've had with my family. And, and, uh, and you need to differentiate between that and the scientific facts, which are on the rest of the slides. The first thing that we thought we had to do was actually monitor how the children were using the technology. And that's such an easy word to use. We didn't want to produce a police state in the house. We didn't want 24-hour surveillance. I know of some houses uh, where they actually have this high technology where they're actually scanning all the internet exchanges for specific words and all the rest of it. We didn't want to go that far. But we did feel the need, especially with the younger children, to be able to see roughly what they were doing. And there's a lot of pressure for the kids to use technology. By, the, by 11 years old, most of their friends are actually online on social network sites, and they wanted to be on them too. And we made it clear that we preferred uh, well-established social network sites to chat rooms, because we found that it was easier to monitor what was going on and what had gone on. We gave them talks about cyber safety. And we also suggested that it was, n was not appropriate to be making new friends. And if they were making new friends using these sites, then we needed to know about it. And we also found that monitoring has been necessary for homework use. And you know, increasingly, um, we've become dissatisfied as parents that we're not being given advice by the schools as to how we should be helping our children use technology for homework. Because quite often, um, when you leave a child uh, to do their homework, you come back a few minutes later, and you see all these windows that have popped up. They're instant messaging. Um, they're on Facebook. They're doing all this other stuff. And they think that. It's all about multitasking. And multitasking is cool. 
Now, there's not a lot of research on this, but when they did do a survey of American undergraduates, the result was that, yeah, most of the undergraduates were, were multitasking in this way, and most of them found that it was distracting them from their work. And in fact, a recent study has shown that, I mean, first of all, let's be clear, there's no such thing as multitasking, okay? It's actually extremely difficult to attend to two things at the same time. So what's really happening here is you're actually switching your attention between the different windows. And I think the argument has been that if you're a digital native and you're doing that all the time, then you're getting better at multitasking. But actually, the, the evidence is that heavy, um, heavy multitaskers of media are not any better at switching their attention. So that's a bit surprising. Um, so we need to monitor them to make sure they're not, they're not doing that sort of thing. And so we initially constrained them to our kitchen diner and gave them these over-the-shoulder glances. But then, of course, this idea um, that you can keep them in one place just doesn't work because you can now access the internet on mobile devices. They've got little netbooks, they've got phones, even on their iPods, not their iPads, we can't afford those, but they've got iPods, a couple of them have anyway, you can access the internet as well. So, you know, that becomes very difficult as they get older and they acquire these machines. And then, of course, there's this idea that teenagers actually need, and I think deserve, some level of privacy. So that has to be negotiated as well. And we found it quite difficult, this issue of Facebook friends. We found ourselves, oh, please, be, please can I be your friend? Please can I be your friend? Um, in a rather pathetic way. <laughs> but of course, you know, um, it, it's, it's actually a very delicate area. Um, and there was, for example, um, a couple of years ago, uh, my eldest was involved in what I would call a serious incident as a parent. Um, and I wanted to know who else was involved. And I did have a little look on the old Facebook site. And I got a couple of the names of the kids that were involved. I wasn't going to do anything about it. But I did let the name slip when I was talking to him. He immediately knew that I'd got them from Facebook. And I was immediately defriended. And I've never been allowed on again. So, uh, uh, I mean, luckily, you know, his mother has, and so it's, it's okay, we can, you know, there's still sort of proxy monitoring going on. But it's ended up in a sort of a state of unspoken detente. So the deal is, and this is not an official deal, but this is sort of an unspoken deal, is that we can be friends on our kids' sites, providing we never, ever talk about it, refer to it, write on their walls or anything. And that is, a, that is fairly satisfactory for me because I sort of feel, well, if the worst comes to worst and there's a real emergency, I want to know where, I, where they might have been or what's going on or something. That's okay. Okay, so the other issue, another issue is when you're using technology, um, particularly in terms of it disrupting sleep. Sleep is not just about rest. Sleep is also about learning. And what we found out from the science, and we've known this for some time, is that sleep consolidates memory during... The, uh, during the, if you look at the brain activities, which is the, 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 the top three images during wakefulness, those brain activities are to some extent reproduced while you're asleep. And that is happening because you're recycling your memories of the day and you're laying those memories down into, into memory so that they are actually going to last longer. So it's an important part of being able to remember what actually happened during the day. And of course it gets more complicated with Teenagers, because teenagers have some biological basis uh, for saying they need to stay up a bit later and they don't want to get up in the mornings. And this is because of the natural disruption to the circadian rhythms. But of course, um, there are also social pressures. Um, yes, melatonin secretion slows down at puberty and that causes this, this disruption in the sleep cycle. Um, but it's worsened by the habits that arrive with more freedom, of course. And what we find is that um, teenage sleep loss, in particular, uh, is, is linked to the use of technology. There is, there is a link there. We also find that there, are, that there are certain types of technology, particularly these ones with, with a small bright screen, that actually disrupt sleep more than, for example, television. It's because of the intensity of the screen, which is often held quite close to the face, um, that you can see this reduction in melatonin and that is going to, you can expect that to disrupt sleep more. And there is evidence from a, a study done in Europe that shows that teenagers who text after lights out are four times more likely to suffer daytime sleepiness. And that, of course, will also uh, hit onto their academic learning. 
And uh, in the bottom left-hand corner there, you can see my daughter. I think she's called nesting. It's when they, they nest into the duvet. And it's quite part of the going to sleep ritual. They will be there with their mobile, texting with their friends for half an hour before they turn the lights off. And actually, the mobile, the mobile phone, they feel is like part of their body. It's, it's, if you try to take that away from them, they will physically scream. <laughs> and so this is another area where we've found you know, quite difficult to control. We don't want to take their mobiles away from them because we've come to understand that this represents their social network. And it's one of the most severe punishments that you can imagine, really, is to actually... It's almost like being grounded because so much of their social contact occurs through the mobile. So, you know, it's come down to making night raids, you know, having a look round the door, making sure there's no bright lights on and all the rest of it. It's also about what you use technology for. Um, and there are very many positive uses of technology, and, it's going to offer and it is offering fantastic educational opportunities. Um, a review of 22 studies of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, showed that it was a very effective, acceptable, and practical health uh, care, especially when it was delivered over the internet. So, you know, the technology has the opportunity of actually um, uh, healing uh, our, our mental abilities, as well as causing detriment. And, of course, the internet can teach, and the People's University is a wonderful example um, of how education can be accessed by students all over the world who otherwise would not be able to uh, achieve a university education. But here is another example of what you use technology for being an issue because computer games do seem to be a special case, and I'm going to say a bit more about that in, in, in a minute. But just have a look at this study because this is the sort of study that we really need more of. This one took me by surprise. Um, a group of 13 to 14 year olds were allowed to pursue three different types of task um, in consecutive weeks. Um, they were allowed to play computer games, they watched TV, or they did neither between 6 and 7 o'clock in the evening. L later in the evening, they were asked to memorize, actually quite soon after the activity, they were asked to memorize uh, two minutes of facts. So if you like, this was kind of like a controlled homework exercise. And what we find is that we, if we look in the top graph there, that's the percentage of slow wave sleep. Slow wave sleep, that's the important sleep for consolidating the memory that the uh, children achieved that night. So in the base conditions where they were doing no technology, you can see that they actually had the highest percentage of slow wave sleep. It was less for television, and it was less again when they'd been using computer games. They were also asked the next day to recall the facts and it's exactly the same trend. The percentage of memory loss for those facts was least for the base condition where there was no technology. There was some memory loss for those who watched TV between 6 and 7 o'clock. And there was the greatest memory loss for those children who had been playing video games. Now, that surprises me because I think that that is actually a very well-managed evening. Well, in our household, anyway. <laughs> I mean, if you could restrict technology use to just between 6 and 7 o'clock, and then you could get them to do some homework, you know, that's, that's not doing too bad. I do wonder what would have happened if they'd done it the other way around, or if the technology use had taken place between 8 and 9 o'clock or whatever. I don't know. But I sure would like to know, and that's why we need more research of this type. Of course, it is also a matter of how much you are using the technology. And we have evidence to show that children's exercise can be disrupted if the use is excessive. And I was very interested to see Michael's research that he was showing us about the link between technology use and obesity. And we have these guidelines from the American Pediatrics Association that say two hours a day of total screen time should be the limit. Now, of course, for many children, that limit has already been exceeded by the time they get home from school because they've been using technology in, in the school. And so, you know, I think we have to start differentiating a little bit more carefully between the, what they're actually using the technology for. And in our household, um, we've had to have an awful lot of small print in the contract. So we say, yeah, two years, uh, sorry, two years, two hours of total time a day, uh, in, well, total time in the evenings of leisure use, but it's okay if it's involving homework, it has an educational purpose, it's creative, it involves some musical activity, or it's a physical game. 
And I can assure you that that small print is exploited to the full by our children in all sorts of ways. But we do have cutoff points. So, for example, you know, up to 11 years old, 7 p.m., up to 14 year olds, 8 p.m. And then we have to have a cutoff point for the adults because we also suffer from uh, you know, abuse of technology in terms of it disrupting our sleep sometimes. And yes, it's about how much you use it, and I think we have to accept, as was already mentioned in the previous talk, that there is a, a small percentage of our population, and I'm talking adults as well as children, who have really problematic use of the internet. The percentage of the population varies according to the different studies, according to the different cultural backgrounds. Some of that is to do with the methods that have been used to um, collect the data. But one thing is for sure, we do have some people who have really problematic, excessive use of the internet. And the sort of predictors um, that identify somebody who's at risk of that sort of behavior is low self-esteem, anxiety. Now, uh, as was mentioned before, it's not an official psychiatric disorder yet. And to mention one of the arguments as to why it isn't, um, some critics of the idea suggest that if we say internet addiction is a psychiatric disorder, then we also have to include many other types of compulsive behaviours, such as shopping, working, football, etc. However, um, I do think that there is um, something of specific interest here that we should be paying more attention to. Before I say what that is, my conclusion looking at all of the, well, most of the research was that there was, in almost all respects, no evidence of digital technology's special influence on the brain. And that well-being in our new digitized environment really boiled down to transferring offline everyday wisdom and common sense to this new digital environment. And the sort of wisdom that that results in is choosing activities with obvious benefit, moderating and varying the activities, thinking about that two hours entertainment screen time, and also healthy scheduling of when the children are actually um, using the technology. Now, I did say in almost all respects. However, let's just go back to that figure and, and, and ask ourselves, of that, that small percentage of the population who have a problematic level of internet use, what are they actually doing? Well, if it's adults, I'm ashamed to say we're looking at pornography or we are pursuing illicit relationships. If it's young people who have the problem, then they are video gaming. Video gaming is very engaging, and this is one of the statistics that actually demonstrates that. It's also demonstrated by a study that was done by Han et al. in 2011 that showed that when players view images from internet games, similar neural activities are stimulated as when addicts of drugs or gambling see cues of their addiction. So we do have to restrict video game play and I have actually found this, we've also found this to be quite difficult, especially since children of different ages in the same household have different bedtimes, different you know, schedules of after school clubs and all the rest. And yet at one point we were wondering whether they were only interested in computer games and it really did reach a sort of crisis point. So we did pursue um, one of these all out bans for about four months over the summer period. And yeah, trees were climbed, books were read, musical instruments were picked up and it's certainly something that we're gonna repeat again this year. Why are they so engaging? Well, games like many pleasures stimulate the brain's reward system. I'm talking about sex, drugs, rock and roll. Yes, all of those things have been measured in brain scanners. And they've all been shown to engage this particular part of the brain. In video games, we have a very rapid schedule of rewards arriving almost every second. And we have seen in imaging studies that that stimulates the reward system. Not only is there a very rapid schedule of rewards arriving, but those rewards are uncertain. And I'll explain why that's significant in a second. The amount of dopamine release in this reward system of the brain when people are playing video games is equivalent to that seen as a result of taking psychostimulant drugs such as amphetamines or methylphenidate, otherwise known as Ritalin. So there's almost a sense in which video games are like a sort of environmental Ritalin. If you did apply mental health criteria for addiction. In the UK, we have about 20%, one in five teenagers who are addicts. 
Although, as I've said, that is a controversial thing to do at the moment. So going back to what we tried to do about this, I mean, we were seeking some sort of commercial product that would somehow control the amount of video game use, but the ones that we found were not wholly satisfactory. We found one, for example, to control a PS2 games console, but we always had to keep resetting the timing at the beginning, and that caused a lot of arguments. And then there was a, a warning light that came on and told the kids that it was going to shut off. And then, of course, there was an uproar because they wanted an extension. And then they were hacking the password, so the whole thing became completely useless anyway. So instead, it all boiled down to using a very primitive device that was knocked up in the shed, which is really just a, a main speed to a multi-socket box, um, all locked up in a plastic box. And, and this, this mains uh, block was actually on a digital timer, and it just comes on and then it switches off all the boys' technology in their room at 9 o'clock at night, and they can't switch anything on at all. Now, of course, that's not the whole control. You know, we are going in saying, okay, you've had two hours or whatever sometimes. But at least you know at 9 o'clock, everything shuts down. And you do hear the cry go up, oh! <laughs> and a few other words. But the night, they don't seem to engage you in an argument about it. They sort of kick the box instead. So, <laughs> Why are uncertain rewards the sort of rewards offered by technology so engaging? Well, this uh, monkey might be able to tell us because it's having its dopamine measured whilst looking at, uh, well, a computer game? Well, sort of. Um, it's looking at visual patterns that are appearing on a screen. And the visual pattern appears on the screen, and then a few seconds later, it may or may not receive a reward, such as a drop of honey. If it's a visual pattern that is always associated in the past with that drop of honey, as soon as it sees the, as soon as it sees the, the, the uh, visual pattern come on, you get a spike of dopamine because it knows it's going to get a drop of honey. When the drop of honey actually arrives, um, you don't get any, actually arrives here, you don't get any dopamine release at all because the event was so 100% predictable. When a stimulus arrives that has never been associated with reward, you don't get any spike of dopamine because it doesn't anticipate anything's going to happen. But if something does happen, then you get a spike of dopamine. It says, oh, thank you very much. I do want that reward. Now, the interesting thing is, when it sees patterns that half the time in the past have been associated with a reward, but, but half the time have not produced a reward, then it gets a spike as soon as it sees the pattern, and then the anticipation actually causes the dopamine to ramp up until the outcome is known. Now that means if you integrate over time, uncertain rewards generate more dopamine in the reward system than either wholly predictable rewards or wholly unexpected rewards. And this has been used to explain why we are so attracted to games. And in fact, in, in real life, we find that humans are most excited and most interested in outcomes that are 50% probable. It's also of note that when you look at reward activity against age here, then the um, activity actually peaks during around 13, 14 years old. It is also true that there is uh, a gender bias towards boys for risk-based dopamine production. So I can imagine you can all see where I'm going with this. We also know that around puberty, uh, female ovarian hormones um, mature the reward system in a way that doesn't happen with boys. So girls grow up to be women, and around about 12 or 13, you often see them putting away their Nintendos, whereas boys will be boys, essentially. I'm making terrible generalizations there. It's certainly, I think I should say, actually, that is really not a, a proven scientific relationship, but you can sort of see that it could become one. Um, now, let's get back to the science, because this midbrain dopamine really does uh, explain our engagement in a number of activities, and it probably, uh, well, it does explain uh, a lot of why we're so interested in, in video games. But whilst it's actually telling us about why we attend to certain stimuli, it's also important because midbrain dopamine has been shown to predict learning. In other words, that dopamine is actually responsible for increasing the rate at which neurons make connections. In other words, synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity is the efficiency of the connections between neurons. This is a neural network with six neurons um, connected to each other, and this is what helps us think. You get an input represented by the arrows there, 
And that input travels down towards other neurons, is then transmitted to other neurons. And because the connections have different levels of efficiency, what comes out at the end is very different to what went in at the beginning. And that gives us the ability to think. Our ability to learn comes about from changes in the efficiency of those synaptic connections. And that, that process of changing that efficiency in the connections is increased, the rate of it is increased, the efficiency of it is increased as a result of dopamine. So um, that helps explain some rather interesting phenomena that have come to our attention recently. Most importantly, we've found that video games are incredible teachers. I say incredible because they have succeeded in doing things that scientists have been trying to do for decades and failing to do. Most particularly, enhancing our cognitive functions. Action video games have been shown to improve performance on many visual motor tasks, our ability to switch visual attention, our ability to suppress visual distraction, to be able to infer an action's probable outcome, and they've even been shown to improve contrast sensitivity, which is the primary factor that limits our sight. All of that may be as a result of the reward activity stimulating enhanced synaptic um, plasticity. That's a theory. It's a theory which I'm pursuing. It's a theory that Daphne Bavelier and other neuroscientists are pursuing. It's not a self-selection effect. Just 10 hours of play can generate transferable benefits in non-game players. And this transferable is the important thing because actually people always get better at training tasks. What's really incredible is when that, ability, that improvement actually transfers to other types of tasks. We have longitudinal studies that can track the improvements in relation to gameplay. So if you're doing more gameplay, you get faster, quicker. When you stop playing gameplay, the improvement slows down. And of the few studies undertaken, effects have been found to transfer to some professional activities. So there is actually a bunch, there's about five or six papers now, um, that show practice on a Wii can improve your laparoscopic surgery skills. And in fact, the Israeli Defense Force now insists that their fighter pilots play action video games because it's been shown to improve their performance in the air. Reportedly, it also improves the piloting of drones, but the when the military started talking about that, it became so controversial, they just shut up about it immediately. But of course, if action video games are good at teaching those types of cognitive uh, process, then that may explain why they are also good at teaching effective response. And I thought that there was some sort of debate going on about whether action video games improved, in, um, in, sorry, whether action video games, whether violent video games increased aggressive tendencies. And there has been some sort of debate. But when you look at the evidence, I find it quite convincing. We have three converging sets of evidence. We have correlational evidence that show that violent gamers are more aggressive. We have experimental evidence that show that non-gamers' aggression increases when they've been playing violent video games. We have longitudinal evidence to show that aggressive tendencies actually vary with gaming habits. Um, again, how much is a factor? And it should, I should also point out that it's not ethical or possible, therefore, to assess real violence as a result of playing violent video games. So what we're looking at here is aggressive tendencies, often self-reports about how they would behave in hypothetical situations. But there's also evidence to show that people become neuro neurophysiologically desensitized having played violent video games. So if you measure the electrical field due to neural activity when looking at real violence, video of real violence, if somebody has been playing a violent video game, then that brain activity is reduced. At the same time, we can't blame the technology because pro-social games can teach empathy and there is an equally convincing set of evidence to show that as well. However, in our house, um, and I was very liberal, really, I have to say, ashamedly. I mean, when I'd done this review of the evidence, I felt, as many parents often do, I suspect, uh, not the best parent in the world, uh, because I'd never really taken much notice of the certification on the video games that my children were playing. But having looked at the evidence, uh, I take this much more seriously now. 
But it's not easy, because we often have uh, characters such as my youngest here, Finn, playing these games vicariously. He's supposed to be on his Nintendo, but as you can see, he's actually playing the game that's being enjoyed by the older children. Actually, they're not playing a violent video game, I have to say, but the, uh, the issue is illustrated, I think. And there is an upside to this, because if video games are such wonderful teachers, we'll be able to use this in education, I am sure of it. In fact, we have shown from our own research that we can estimate learning in an educational uh, game based on the estimated brain's reward response. So the relationship between reward and learning has never been properly demonstrated. If you give children more gold stars, they don't necessarily learn more. However, there is a clear relationship between the way in which the brain responds to reward and learning. And we know that video games stimulate the reward system a lot. So we can use this, and in fact we are using this, and we're developing teaching methods in the classroom now that have different types of reward. Instead of getting points for a correct answer, you get the chance to win points. It turns lessons into games. We have the emergence of sport talk, uh, and, and we have motivational talk, and it really is a, a very exciting development. And uh, if you want to know more about that, you can go to the website. So in summary, I would say that there are many opportunities to technology, but there are also some risks attached. If we consider risk as some product of likelihood and consequence, then what rose to the top of the pile for me were issues such as excessive use, disrupted sleep, aggression from violent gaming. But the risks are avoidable. It is about how you use it. And I feel that what we need most is information to teachers, schools, software developers about digital hygiene, how to use and develop technology in a way that supports well-being. We have enough research now to be able to to start developing those sorts of guidelines. And that information should be out there so that teachers, parents can make their own decisions about how best to do it. I would also say that video gaming is a special influence on the brain. It offers exceptional levels of engagement and exceptional enhancement of learning processes. Or as one neuroscientist has put it, it even offers the possibility of taking the brakes off adult plasticity. And is now being used as a basis for controlling Alzheimer's, for example, and preventing cognitive decline in, in healthy individuals. The same brain processes are involved with both the hazard and the benefits of gaming. And we need to know more about those processes if we are going to use technology for um, the best um, human benefit that it can provide. Thank you very much. How is that for taking an incredibly complex topic and making it in a very short period of time understandable and digestible? Um, Paul, you're a very gifted teacher, so thank you for that. So those of you who have questions, if you can make your way to the microphones. We have some questions from the webcast. And um, Paul, I'll give you the first question from Julie. And it is, so what age is it appropriate to, to allow your child to have a cell phone? <laughs> Easy question. What age is it appropriate to allow your child to have a cell phone? Well, I mean, I, I mean again, I feel I'm being put on the spot and, and, and providing, being asked to provide advice. And I, I'm not trying to um, avoid the question, but I think it depends on the child and, and what the child is actually doing with it. Um, my youngest child wanted to learn to spell their name, not so that they could write it with a pen, but so that they could Google it. Um, and, and as soon as he, he'd learned how to spell his name, he Googled it, and, and you might be thinking, oh, like father, like son. But actually, it was an instructive educational experience, I think, and it generated a lot of interesting dialogue, and, and, a, and a, it was a valuable experience. So I don't think that there's an age limit. I think it depends on what the child is going to be doing with it. And, and can I also just refer to some research that was done in the UK about early learning 
um, environments. It's not actually the richness of the environment in terms of the gadgets and the resources and the posters on the wall and all the colors and fluffy things that you might want to buy your child that really counts in terms of their development. It's actually what they are encouraged to do with those things. And this result has come out of the EPI project in the UK. And it's, it's really very clear. It doesn't matter how well resourced a nursery is, it's actually the quality of the teachers and the activities and the teacher child interaction that makes a difference in terms of their development. So there's no age limit. I don't think there's any age limit in terms of a child having a mobile, but it all depends um, about the types of interaction that they will be encouraged to have with the mobile by the parent. Thank you. Yeah, the earlier uh, discussion you had about how we use it, when we use it, how much yeah, we use it. Absolutely. Okay, questions for Dr. Howard Jones. Hard to see with the light. We have, uh, we're very lucky to have a um, uh, senior neuroscientist here all the way from the UK. So we've got people lining up. We'll take one on this side. Uh, is there any research directed towards using video games as a means to deal with other types of addiction? Um, all I can say is that I know that there is research underway in the Netherlands to do exactly that. So this has been identified as a possibility. Um, there is already, of course, cognitive behavioral therapy available over the internet, which has been shown to, to be effective. Um, but the actual specific use of video games uh, is, is still in a state of research, and I know that it is being pursued actively in, in countries such as the Netherlands. Thank you. And we'll take the question over here. Actually, I think it was essentially the same question. If it, it's not an official diagnosis, but uh, um, Dr. Uh, Rich earlier referred to children coming into his office, and we see it in our families, see it in our schools. What does one do when we suspect that this is having a seriously negative, or serious negative impact on our children or our, our students? H how do you treat it? What well, I mean, first of all, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a pediatrician uh, um, like, like, like Michael. Um, I, I would, I, I can only respond as I would a, a parent, really, which, which is to give it a break and, and see if it makes a difference. If you suspect that a particular use of a technology is not having a beneficial effect, then it should be possible to have a holiday from it. If it's not possible to have a holiday from it, then there is... An issue, <laughs> I would say, as a parent. Okay. Ken Marshall, um, thank you. I belong to two subgroups. I'm a neo geezer and a techno peasant. <laughs> and I get on the email about once a month or so something sent along by a friend that says uh, how to improve your brain age or how to improve your cognitive skills. And I often open it up and I play with it for a few minutes. If I were more diligent, would I be doing myself any good? <laughs> it depends. It depends on, on, on the software that you're using. I mean, this is a really interesting, potentially exciting area. I said earlier that scientists had pretty well failed to enhance cognitive function with their many computer-based training programs that they had developed in the laboratory. There's one area where they have actually been having quite a lot of success, and that is in the enhancement of working memory. And that's very significant because working memory is very closely related to fluid intelligence, which is the best predictor we have of educational and professional performance. And researchers such as Suzanne Yegi, for example, in, in Austria, have found that 30 minutes of working memory training improves not just working memory ability, but also the fluid intelligence of those, um, in a transferable way, this is, of those people who are training. We're talking about young adults. There are also well-publicized reports, and there was a paper recently in Nature, that were saying brain training doesn't work. Well, I think most of the methods of 
that, that have been developed to train the brain actually have been a failure. But working memory training is an area which, which has a lot of, of hope and potential. What I don't understand is why there hasn't been more commercial exploitation of it and why people such as Nintendi Nintendo are not all over it trying to <laughs> apply it. So when you look at the commercial products that are available, they are, and I reviewed them recently actually for, for Witch magazine, they are, they are almost entirely unevaluated and those evaluations that have taken place uh, have not been done under very convincing scientific conditions. So there's a real mismatch at the moment between what we know about the potential of brain training and actually what is being uh, produced by, by the commercial developers. Thank you. We are the parents of uh, teenagers and I, we have seen how uh, social networking and texting has replaced dating. And I think uh, many parents of teenagers will, have, will attest to that. Are there studies or is there research that sort of uh, explores how this phenomenon of, of social networking uh, affects for good or for ill uh, the richness or the, the depth of social connections and social relationships? Are we stuck at simply uh, su superficial texting and sort of uh, interpersonal connections through Facebook? Uh, what's happening? I'm not, I'm not sure that I would say that the type of communication that takes place on Facebook and texting is, is always superficial. I think that's the first point I'd like to make. And I remember the last time I had a conference such as this, um, a young guy stood up and said, um, you know, I, I came out as being gay on, on Facebook and on the internet, and it was one of the, the, the best things I ever did. And this, is, this has been something which has transformed my life, really, in a very positive way. Um, so I, I don't see necessarily that, it, that using this technology is, is something which um, necessarily inhibits the development of social relationships. I, I, I just don't buy that. What I, what I do, uh, what we do know from the research is that when it is used to make new friendships, as I said before, you know, there are certain types of behavior uh, using the technology which are linked to, 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 to poor outcomes. Um, so, and then the other problem is that, no, there isn't research looking at the quality of intimate relationships between teenagers um, as a result of using Facebook. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, one is it's, it's very difficult to know how you would go about establishing such a controlled research in terms of making sure that it is actually scientifically valid. But the other problem is an ethical problem uh, involved with um, getting teenagers to discuss the, the details of their intimate relationships. So it's a very difficult area to study, and I suspect that that is why we don't have that research. But I, I, I don't feel... I don't feel we have any evidence to suggest that Facebook, using Facebook and, and texting and other types of technology um, un, is necessarily reducing the, the quality of social interaction. Okay, over here. Hello. Um, uh, listening to what you said earlier about replacing situations of reward points with situations for potential reward points, uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about gamification or the artificial imposition of uh, reward points on school or social settings for desired behaviors. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, this is an area which I'm particularly interested in. So um, I, I do have some thoughts, and what I've got to try to do is summarize them as quickly as possible. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I said that 50% that outcomes w were the, the, the type of... Um, probability that gets us most excited. You know. When you move into the sorts of social environments that exist in schools, we find that children don't, for example, choose problems that are 50% that are likely to give them a, a positive outcome. They actually prefer 90%, around about, I think it's measured at 87 in one particular task. So, yeah, 100% is too boring. They know they're going to get it right. 80% they feel uncomfortable with. And why is that? Well, because it reflects on their social and self-esteem. So when I'm talking about reward uncertainty, I'm actually talking about the types of uncertainty that arises out of chance. 
So when it comes to gamification, as you put it, of, of pedagogy or gamification of education, the message is quite clear. What we need to do is to move towards 50% probabilities in the classroom, but not through providing difficult tasks, but actually by introducing uncertainty, chance-based uncertainty. And then when you do that, you have this revolution, really, in terms of the sort of discourse that's taking place around learning, and much higher degrees of, of, of engagement. Um, and that's, that's the sort of thing that's, that's getting us really excited at the moment, working with teachers in classrooms. OK, Michael, if you can come up. On behalf of the Alberta Teachers Association and the Alberta Center for Child, Family, and Community Research, I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. And for those of you who are online, I want to thank you for your participation. And I recognize the irony of what is technology doing to our bodies <laughs> with 5,000 people online. But um, most importantly, Paul and Michael both have large families, very busy lives, and busy careers. And I want to thank both of you for the gift of time that you've given us. I think it's our good fortune to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you.